Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Our broadcast today is brought to you by our show sponsor. Huge thanks out to HelloFresh. HelloFresh wants to change how people eat because life is just crazy busy and because eating out at restaurants is crazy expensive and because there's a better way, there's a better option for natural, delicious, healthy meals at home. It's an option that I use with my own family. HelloFresh is the meal kit delivery service that ships right to my door. They ship the exactly measured ingredients and recipes that I need to make really good meals in my own kitchen. Meals that don't require trips to the grocery store. They eliminate food waste. And there's a variety of dishes that I can custom fit to my own preferences. And you can do the same. Order the classic box, the veggie box, the family box. You can have three, four, or five different meals a week that feed two to four people per meal. They take only about 30 minutes to prepare each meal. And they're just a fantastic option for the veteran cook or the kitchen novice. And right now, you can get $35 off your first week of HelloFresh deliveries. Just go to HelloFresh.com and enter my promo code, Seth Andrews, when you subscribe. Go to HelloFresh.com and enter my promo code, Seth Andrews. Okay, the broadcast today and the broadcast next Tuesday are... If I may, they're opposite sides of the same coin. And today we're talking about Satan. We're going to talk about the Satanic Temple. I'll be speaking with the co-founder of the Satanic Temple, a guy who's been in the headlines quite a bit over the past several years, Lucian Greaves. I find his story fascinating, and we're going to talk to him about much of what he does and why he does it. Next Tuesday, we're going to talk about Jesus. So I got Satan this week. I got Jesus next week. Next week, I'm speaking to David Fitzgerald. He's got a brand new book, which just came out. It's called Jesus, Mything in Action. Now, those of you who follow David Fitzgerald and have heard him on the radio before and have read his previous book, Nailed, you're aware that he's a mythicist. He does not believe there was an actual guy, an actual literal man that the Jesus legend was based upon which has been kind of the prevailing notion out there. Well, of course, there was a literal Jesus somewhere. These legends appeared based on something, someone, and just got elaborated on over time. And more and more, that notion is coming into question. It's being challenged by people like David Fitzgerald. So we're going to talk about Jesus. Was he a myth? What is the evidence that's being presented? We're going to talk about this book, which is being called by some the Jesus Killer. That's coming up next Tuesday with David Fitzgerald. So don't miss that. Well, let's go ahead and flip that coin back over and get into the conversation today regarding the Satanic Temple. He is reportedly, allegedly, an agent of the Dark Lord himself. He is one of the more controversial figures in the headlines that we see from time to time, especially when the headlines have to do with violations of the church-state line. Is he truly a Satanist? We'll find out as my special guest joins us for the show. It's Lucian Greaves. Lucian, thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me. I'll begin with the pink mass. <laughs> I'm just going to jump <laughs> right in, okay? Sure. Uh, July 2013, members of the Satanic Temple, including yourself, travel to the Phelps family graveyard in Mississippi. You're visiting the grave of Fred Phelps' mom. Now, Fred Phelps, of course, is the famous founder of Westboro Baptist Church. We've spoken to Nate Phelps many times on this broadcast. His mom, Fred Phelps' mom, buried at Magnolia Cemetery. You traveled there to perform the Pink Mass. I'm going to let you finish the story. Explain why you were there. Well, the idea of going and and performing some kind of ritualistic protest against the Westboro Baptist Church came to us. After the aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombing, when uh, 
the Westboro Baptist Church was going to show up in Boston to protest the funerals of the victims of the marathon bombing. Several counter protesters showed up to meet the Westboro Baptist Church where they were supposed to arrive. Where Westboro Baptist Church didn't come, but then they were tweeting that uh, they were honored that so many people had shown up just to see them and that they were there with them in spirit. And we figured on similar terms, could we do something about the Westboro Baptist Church in spirit that would kind of have some effect and counterbalance their stupidity? So we came up with this idea of visiting Fred Phelps's mother's grave and performing a ritual there that was supposed to ostensibly turn his uh, Fred Phelps's mother gay in the afterlife. And we were also clear on the point afterwards that We didn't actually believe in the supernatural aspects of this, and we didn't believe that we had turned her gay in the afterlife. But making commentary upon the arguments that the Westboro Baptist Church themselves took all the way to the Supreme Court, that belief is inviolable, we put forward the idea that we believed that they were now obligated to believe that she was gay in the afterlife. And despite anything they might say to the contrary, our belief was inviolable, and we were taking the liberty to believe that they believed that she was gay in the afterlife. Did you get a response from Westboro Baptist Church? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they gave us all the, all the credit we could have hoped for. They, uh, they ran one of their famous flyers uh, against us that shows, of course, the uh, basic caricatures, of the stick people that you'll see on restrooms, you know, having anal sex with one another, upside-down flag, all the, all the typical logos of the Westboro Baptist Church uh, with some kind of insensible statement about how Satanists, homosexuals, and and all the deviant things in the world, uh, which really, I think, just boiled down to homosexuality in the minds of the Westboro Baptist Church, were all kind of one and the same. And I I don't really remember what the content of this flyer was supposed to convey to us, other than that they understood that we had disrespected them in some way and they were upset about it. Is it true that uh, you were arrested for desecrating a grave? No, that is not true. Uh, the The word is, supposedly, that a warrant was drawn up, and the sheriff had sought to have it drawn up for various things that I guess no judge would sign off on. Uh, one was trespassing, which clearly wasn't true. This wasn't even a gated cemetery. We were there during the day. One was... Uh, that they wanted to draw up violations for, but but wasn't signed off for, uh, was indecent exposure. And if there's not an observer, that's not really, really a crime either. And then uh, vandalism was another one they wanted, but couldn't get signed off on. And as there was absolutely no material damage done to anything, vandalism wasn't actually a real complaint either. Desecration of a grave, apparently they got a judge to sign off on that. And we looked it up later and the language on that is apparently vague enough that if you, by word or by action, you may desecrate a grave. And I think that comes with, uh, that can come with a, uh, a maximum of a year in jail, from what I understand. But of course, we were never served with any papers that said that this, this warrant was legitimate or that this was actually at issue. But that's the word that came out in the press. You were the officiant. You had men making out. You had women making out right there over the headstone, correct? Correct. Did you take any heat from people who were not of Westboro, who thought it was just in poor taste? There was uh, there was some of that, which isn't a surprise, but there was also a lot of support. And, <laughs> and I think uh, that, was, that was more of a surprise, especially then, because people knew a whole lot less about the satanic temple, who we are, and and what we do. So it was all kind of a new concept to them, and all of a sudden Satanists on the scene doing something as as drastic as a a cemetery ritual. We counted on a lot of pushback. I'm not sure which Vice piece you saw. They wrote several, but Vice seemed to have a a kind of positive turn in our favor towards it all. And uh, there was some pushback from the gay community where, and I would say it was a minority of the messages we got where people were saying that, and we get these sometimes from other atheists and secularists too, that they feel that this uh, attaching Satanism to their cause is counterproductive to what they're doing. And, you know, my response to that is, 
our cause maybe isn't yours. Maybe we have some overlapping values, but we're not uh, we're not speaking for the entirety of the gay community. When we're speaking for reproductive rights, we're not speaking for all women. Uh, we're speaking for our deeply held beliefs and our values, and uh, that's all we claim to do, and that's all we we can do. Throughout the show, we're going to get input from our listeners, and I'll go to the switchboard. I have Claudia on Skype. Claudia, you're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast with Lucian Greaves. How are you? I'm all right. Thank you very much for having me, Seth. Do you have a question for Lucian? Do you follow the Satanic Temple? or uh, To an extent. I did follow the uh, the wonderful uh, Oklahoma statue thing. I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, do you have a question or comment for the broadcast today? Yeah, I do. I mean, so first of all, I want to say that, you know, I appreciate that Obviously, the intentions here are the very best of intentions. I actually think a lot of the stuff they do is really funny and actually very useful in calling the question on uh, separation of church and state. So with all that said, I do have a concern, which is atheists, especially atheists in America, already face the stereotype and uh, sort of the libel that we're God haters or that even we're Satanists. And I just wanted to ask Lucian, is he concerned at all about unintentionally reinforcing that stereotype? I mean, they call you call yourselves Satanists if you're conflating Satanists and atheists, even though you don't intend to reinforce stereotypes. This really stands to be used against us. And does this concern you at all? Do you just think it's worth it, or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that, there's there's a there's some long answers to that, and and I feel like that question itself. Uh, expresses a fundamental misunderstanding of of who we are and what we're doing. It's not that we're atheists who arbitrarily attach Satanism to our name in order to shock people, in order to uh, disturb them. Although those are those are all very positive byproducts of what we're doing. We definitely utilize those points. The embrace of blasphemy to us, the the idea of being the the uh, unsilenced inquirers, the heretics, that's very much appealing to us. And somebody like with my kind of background who grew up in the Midwest during the satanic panic and grew away from the religion I I was uh, indoctrinated with, uh, my growing skepticism, and also having a certain love for the art and aesthetic of things that were supposed to be satanic, uh, the music, the games, just the entire culture, it very much had a, a liberating effect upon me. And I like identifying with that. It's, it's not just philosophical it's, or political. It's, it's also aesthetic. It comes down to, to who you are, really. And atheism describes what you're not. You know, we don't believe in a personal Satan. We don't believe in a personal God. We don't believe in supernaturalism. But we feel Satanism describes what we are. And that metaphor of the rebel against tyranny. We feel that that has a, that says a lot, this metaphor about differences in the way of religious thinking and where we find our existential grounding in the world. And that while we feel the Abrahamic religions are very much based upon authoritarianism and an appeal to the authority of the supernatural, Satanism is very much about developing yourself as an individual, developing the individual will and the intellect in questioning all of those things. And to us, we just simply couldn't call it something else for the benefit of other people. But that's not something we'd want to do anyway. We want to make people question the assumptions they've made. To us, it doesn't matter if people look at it one way. We don't want to preserve their ignorance of what this means to us, and we don't want to preserve their superstitions about what Satanism is supposed to mean. Because I think there's one thing we've seen throughout history is that the greatest evils haven't been perpetrated by some hidden underground cult of evil, but it's been perpetrated by people who feel that those cults of evil exist and are trying to undermine the common good. And they go on their witch hunts and and otherwise their brutal mob purges to be rid of them. Claudia, I hope that answered your question and I appreciate you being a part of the broadcast today. Thank you so much for listening. Greatly appreciated. All right. Thank you very much, Seth. Lucian, if we look at the biblical Satan, he is the deceiver. He's the schemer, the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Tell me about the Satan that aligns with the Satanic Temple. From what materials do you construct your own icon of Satan? 
Well, I would I would argue that there is any consistency to the biblical narrative of Satan. Uh, Satan, in its purer form, means the adversary. And it's not clear sometimes in the Bible whether Satan is being referred to as an adversary or a consistent character of the Satan, which kind of comes later in the Christian demonology of the New Testament. In the book of Job, you have Satan in in good standing in God's court, and they decide that they'll give Job a hard time to test out his faith and his loyalty to Jehovah. Later on, as I said, the, the, the Christian demonology takes kind of a more Zoroastrian slant and sees the world as, as uh, in conflict between these dueling factions of, of good and evil. Now, do um, you see them as different characters or their temperament and characteristics change? Well, it, it's folklore. It, it, it's, it's an evolving narrative. And I, yeah. I feel that the best satanic narrative came along during the Romantic literary movement. You had guys like Milton and... and in Byron, in Shelley, in Blake, and they, they were using the satanic narrative to advance this idea of the of a rebel against tyranny. And it, it, that started cohering after Milton put together Paradise Lost, and all the way up until Anatole France's book, Revolt of the Angels, which is the primary text in the Satanic Temple's canon, because it's a, a very clever allegory to speak about world history and and the differential in power between the the church and the and the scientific minded and the heretics and it's just a very interesting framework to view things with and i think you know non supernaturalists atheists can very much benefit from the power of metaphor poetry and literature as a way to enlighten oneself without taking it in a fundamentalist direction and, and believing all of it literally so to us the idea of uh, of atheistic religion isn't disingenuous and isn't just a ploy. We feel that it's very much legitimate. And when people denigrate that and say, well, that's, that's not truly religion, it's sometimes hard to know whether they're giving other religions too much credit or not enough credit. And by that, I mean too much credit in that feeling that there's some value to the intellectually insulting supernaturalisms they attach to the religions, or not enough credit in that uh, the supernaturalist religions aren't also primarily based on being a cultural identity and a kind of unified narrative construct, the likes of which we have with the Satanic Temple. So the characteristics of Satan for you, then, would be what? One that uh, strives, it seeks knowledge. This is more the, the Lucifer giving the apple in the Garden of Eden. And even then, in Genesis, of course, it is acknowledged that uh, there was no mention of of the the serpent being being Satan, Satan yeah. but or Lucifer. But later on, that becomes part of the story, and and we acknowledge this as an as an evolving folklore. This is the Satan that questions the authority, the the ultimate authority of the of the dictator in charge. If I can bring Levay and Satanism into the conversation for just a few, I got the vibe that Anton Levay enjoyed as much as anything scaring religious people with the monster that they themselves created. In other words, the more freaked out they got about invocations of Lucifer, the happier he was to present Lucifer in full living crimson color. Is there a measure of that to what you guys are about at the Satanic Temple? Do you enjoy using a provocative symbol to provoke those who are sort of afraid of these supernatural monsters? Sometimes, uh, sometimes that's a useful tool, and it's only insofar as it gets people, hopefully, to reevaluate what they think they know about these things and see that that supernatural evil that they they presume to combat really isn't there. And there's other problems in the world that we need to confront more directly before running off these paths, uh, uh, searching up demons or or seeking out exorcisms or whatever other ridiculous things. I mean, these things should be subjected to ridicule and mockery, and sometimes you can do that by satirizing them. But I will say that our perceptions on how to approach these things, I think, are changing as the Satanic Temple evolves. One of the earlier actions we did was we came out in support of Rick Scott, the governor of Florida, pushing through a bill to allow religious prayer in schools. And we thought that it would be a, a great kind of uh, thought exercise for the people of Florida to consider Satanists applauding this bill under the pretense that now <laughs> Satanists could express their their religious loyalties in the classroom. Uh, uh, probably something they hadn't considered, obviously, when they were putting forward this, this bill. Um, now, 
we don't like to be disingenuous about anything. We don't want people to think that we support an idiot like Rick Scott or any of the other theocrats in office. We don't like now to to come out in support of something to make it look bad. We really want people to understand where we are coming from. And we want people to understand and acknowledge that this is Satanism. It's Satanism because that's what we identify with and that's what we call it. The type of Satanism that they feel they've been in combat with all these ages has not existed. And Satanism only exists in so far as there are people who identify as Satanists and it doesn't matter whether we're theistic or not. And I think this is the future of religion. I think uh, you're never going to see Christianity completely diminish and go away, at least not in the, in the foreseeable future generations, because of those cultural attachments people have. But I think our best bet is helping people understand that they can still have that cultural identity and attach themselves to the values that they hold dear but they don't need to subscribe to the supernaturalism of it. And I think in the future, and hopefully the near future, you'll see a lot more people identifying as atheistic Christians in the same way that we already see a lot of atheistic Jews, a lot of atheistic Muslims, and other people who still like to engage in the holidays and some of the rituals and some of the community activities. But maybe there'll be also more willing to accept empirical evidence for their truth claims. Back to the switchboard. I've got area code 217. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. What's your name? My name is Deb. Deb, you're on with Lucian Greaves. Do you have a question or comment? I certainly do. I would like to ask, in the very likely event, and actually we're watching it happen in real time, that the current political administration begins assertive violations to the First Amendment of our Constitution. Is the Satanic Temple cooking up ways to challenge the threat to separation of church and state? And if so, what can we do to help? Well, we have a very distinct place in this uh, debate and, and with these issues, and I think people realize where that is. Uh, we're usually the unwelcome beneficiaries of any of the religious liberty exemptions and privileges that the theocrats try to force through. Uh, we can only take these things one at a time, and we're going to see a real pile up, it seems, in the near future here with the Trump administration. But um, we're a fairly young organization. And we've been growing very fast, and it's been very difficult to keep up. There's not a lack of things for us to do. There's generally just a, a, a lack of funds and, and other resources to make it happen. We're always seeking out pro bono legal support on different issues. Um, we didn't get pro bono support on fighting for reproductive rights in Missouri. I'm not sure if everybody's aware that we even have those lawsuits in play, but we have a federal and state lawsuit against abortion restrictions in Missouri because we were claiming a religious exemption from their 72-hour waiting period on having the abortion procedure that tied into their informed consent laws, which were the state-mandated materials a woman was supposed to receive at the clinic. She was supposed to receive them 72 hours before getting the abortion. And these materials state what we feel are items of religious opinion, that life begins at conception and that an abortion kills a distinct, unique human being. And we feel that, you know, so long as these items can't be elevated to scientific absolutes, they very much fall within the purview of religious opinion, and it wasn't the place of the state to push its religious opinion on members of the Satanic Temple who disagree. So we drew up an exemption for a member who was seeking an abortion to not have to receive these materials and not have to wait the 72 hours for the procedure, that was denied, so we filed both a state and federal lawsuit. And uh, Missouri is a RIFRA state, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the law that's often invoked uh, supposedly to protect bakers from having to make gay cakes for weddings. But um, we haven't seen the outcome of those cases yet, but I feel like those are going to be, th those have a real opportunity to change the entire dialogue if those cases go our way. And We'll fight these things as we can, as resources allow, and the, the best thing people can do for us is put us in contact with uh, pro bono lawyers or 
or if they want to donate to our legal funds or even buy merchandise from our website, shopsatan.com, uh, the proceeds go towards the campaigns we <laughs> undertake as well. Shopsatan.com. I got to go there. I got to definitely check yeah. that out. That's so. awesome. <laughs> Deb, does that answer your question? Anything else? It certainly does. Uh, so we'll all just be ever vigilant and continue the fight. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for calling, Dave. Thanks appreciate too. you. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. This ties into another question I had from Cheryl. She said, how does the temple go about raising funds for legal matters? And how do you decide which battles to fight? Our, our funding has come primarily from donations from people who work with us. I mean, we put a lot of our own money into this and people who donate to us or buy merchandise from us. And as for choosing what we'll do, we'll, we, we do what we can. And uh, the reproductive rights cases in Missouri so far have been the most difficult for us because they've been the most cost prohibitive and we didn't get pro bono support. But sometimes that makes the difference on what we take and what we don't. Sometimes the Freedom From Religion Foundation will reach out to us and see if we want to engage in a in an open forum that has been opened up by theocrats who have, are under the impression that they'll be the only beneficiaries of that forum. And then uh, with that, we often have the support of the legal counsel that asked us for our presence to begin with. We've had support from the ACLU and Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. We consult with the legal counsel sometimes of the American Humanist Association and various other secular groups. While we don't have any of our own in-house lawyers, and I really think we would be a massively more destructive force to theocracy if we did, we do pretty good with our networking that we have now. That said, the whole game could change for us fairly soon if Trump comes through on repealing the Johnson Amendment. And for those who aren't familiar, the Johnson Amendment prevents churches from directly engaging in politics. And a lot of people say, well, they they give their political opinion at the pulpit anyway, and that's true. And the IRS never calls them out on that. But what repealing the Johnson Amendment will do will allow religious nonprofit organizations that don't even file 990s at the end of the year to pump money into political candidates and campaigns So this is just a a way of really building a massive political money laundering scheme. Uh, But in any case, what that means for the Satanic Temple is, on principle, we didn't accept tax exemption at the beginning. We feel churches, religious organizations, they should pay their taxes. We filed as an LLC religious organization. However, if the Johnson Amendment is repealed, we feel it would just be a massive disadvantage for us to not then claim religious tax exemption. So we're pretty well decided at this point that if it is repealed, we will claim that exemption. And then people who are uh, donating to us will be able to write off their donations as well. And we feel that, you know, as horrific as that repeal is for the United States at large, it'll be a whole new game for the Satanic Temple and hopefully give us a whole new advantage of our own. You want to share your thoughts on the new administration? What do you think? Uh, well, <laughs> obviously I'm not. <laughs> obviously I'm not a fan of the Trump administration. Okay. Uh, one thing we're one, one thing we're trying to be clear with our our chapters and our membership now, though, is that as a political organization, we're not going to align specifically with political groups or come out in general against a political party or even candidate. Except in rare circumstances, we did endorse candidates who aligned themselves with TST previously, um, and that's that's something we'll we'll obviously do, and we we can do any of that, as I said, unlike the other organizations that aren't supposed to do that because of the Johnson Amendment, because we do pay our taxes. But um, you're more about the issues. Yeah, right. Exactly. We we want to make sure that uh, when we're protesting against something, that when we're taking issue against something that everybody's clear exactly what the issue is and that we have an argument for it and that we will take these things an issue at a time. And when Trump does something stupid, inevitably, day by day, we will have very clear reasons as to why we're opposing that. And as an organization, we're not just putting uh, general condemnations on, on 
on a party or anything else. I mean, that all said, I, I, this administration is obviously horrific. And we, we, we were very clear on who Mike Pence was before the primaries. Uh, you know, we have membership in Indiana and he was he was disastrous over there. And he's a he's a gynophobic theocrat uh, who's very much hell bent on overturning Roe v. Wade. Betsy DeVos, of course, is trying to undermine the education system and allow federal funds for religious charter schools, which gives us some obvious ideas as well. Um, Scott Pruitt, head of the EPA now, we had to deal with him when we were putting forward the Baphomet Monument in Oklahoma. And here was a man so unclear as to what his responsibilities and duties in office were that when the state Supreme Court ruled against the Ten Commandments monument standing on the grounds that it violated the separation of church and state, he sought to have their their state constitution revised. Even though that wouldn't pass muster federally, that's the caliber of character you now have as head of the EPA, besides his other faults, which are being a, a climate change denialist, and I'm sure, you know, there's just a whole, just the whole cabinet is terrible. They're going to keep you busy probably in the coming months and years, I would assume. So. Oh, yeah. Wanna... And, and as soon as the election results came in, you could feel the change. Uh, those of us in the Satanic Temple could feel the change. All of a sudden, it wasn't funny anymore. You know, people, yeah. people thought this was kind of a, a great prank, people on the outside. And I felt like we were covered a lot differently And as soon as it became clear that Trump was going to take the election, our membership numbers really spiked and they they've been on a, they've been on a a higher plateau ever since. I'm going to come back to the Baphomet statue. I want to talk more about this 10 commandments controversy. I want to speak about the monument that you sought to put on taxpayer funded property. But first I want to go back to the switchboard one more time real fast. I had a question in from uh, Justin Scott of Iowa atheist. Justin, are you there? Yep. I'm here. Justin, you're on the radio with Lucian Greaves. You have a question or comment? Yeah. Hi Lucian. Thanks for coming on. A uh, quick question for you. Do you appreciate when activists like myself invoke the satanic temple or Satanists in general into questions uh, when we try to get Christian lawmakers to understand why the separation of religion and government is so important and why we must fight against a Christian theocracy? Yeah, I, I love it. I, I, to me, that's a sign of success. To me, I feel good when, when that's brought into question. And I know it's happened uh, more than a few times where I've seen uh, news or transcripts from hearings or whatever else where there's questions of whether or not uh, some jurisdiction will put a Ten Commandments monument up on public grounds or some other type of religious monument or open up what's supposed to be the limited public forum for religious expression. And somebody has the wit to say, well, what happens to us when the Satanists come in? And that's exactly the kind of questions they should be answering. These are the things they should be considering. These are the things they should have had to consider all along. But before the Satanic Temple came along, that was usually a, a hypothetical that people didn't feel they would have to contend with. These questions were brought up when the good news clubs were coming into the, the schools and the Supreme Court ruled to open up the, the, the school properties as essentially a public forum. And people were asking, well, what happens when the Raelians come in or, or somebody tries to run some kind of Hitler Youth Club or whatever else? And people would say, well, uh, it's a free speech issue. We, we really can't do anything. But they really weren't considering it very deeply because they felt confident that this would never happen. And that's something that they didn't want would come into the schools or, or into the public forum and be putting forward a, a symbolism or, or ideology that they entirely disagreed with. And I just feel like we're giving people a really long overdue lesson on what religious liberty actually means. The term has been co-opted for so long by evangelists who feel that all these religious liberty rules and exemptions and privileges only apply to them. Justin, do you invoke the Satanic Temple when you're having conversations with these Christian politicians? Absolutely, I do. And I make sure to get it on on video as well so that everyone can see not just how they answer, but how they react when they hear that word or that phrase. How do they react? I mean, you say the word satanic to most Christian politicians. What kind of response do you get back? Yeah, at, at first, it's it's definitely the deer in headlights look. But then when you press them and you say, listen, I'm being serious. I'm not throwing that out there as a joke. I want you to answer 
uh, that's when they try to step around it, or at least in my experiences, they try to tiptoe around it and act like, well, you know, we're doing this for everybody. Well, it's like, you're really not. Is your point, Lucian, that they're just in the Christian privilege business? Yeah. And it would be the evangelicals say, I mean, there's been a lot of commentary of people realizing that they feel they're persecuted if they're not allowed to act in a theocratic fashion and push their beliefs upon everybody else. But uh, in a way, they're right. That is very much uh, what they believe in. They believe they need to bring their salvation to the rest of the world. And, and it's very much part of the evangelical belief system that they need to order the world around their religious thinking. So in that sense, their religious expression is being restricted when they're not allowed to act theocratically. But they just need to come to grips with the fact that this nation is not theirs. This is a secular nation and is very much, uh, on paper at least, uh, they're, they're making great strides in, in revising it now. But this nation just really wasn't founded in, in their image. Justin, does that answer your question, my friend? Yeah, absolutely. That was fantastic. Thanks for being a part of the broadcast. Much appreciated. Yeah, I have on Skype Alexander, one of the hosts of the show, The Skeptic Feminist, who has a question. Alexander, are you there? You have a question? That's right. From our previous secular collaborations with the Satanic Temple to keep Christianity in check in public schools, our understanding is that the Satanic Bible has ethical mandates that are objectively superior to those of Abrahamic religions of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, an example being an edict against rape, consent being a key touchstone of the satanic religion. My question is, what is Lucian's attitude toward feminism and men's rights activism, and have the groups ever collaborated with them in the past? Yeah, I, I, we have uh, plenty of, of members and, and chapter heads and people working with us who consider themselves satanic feminists. Um, to me, though, the term feminism requires a bit of elaboration. I never know when somebody says they're a, a feminist, uh, which direction they're coming at it from. Are you talking pro-sex worker rights, uh, or are you talking the anti-pornography type of feminist? Uh, there's a very wide spectrum. So to me, you know, feminism is often a confusing term, but I'm very much for women's equality and those types of values. And as I said, you know, like uh, Jex Blackmore, another very prominent figure in the Satanic Temple, very much identifies herself as a Satanist, uh, a Satanic feminist, that is, sorry. But to me, I always do have reservations on I'm just jumping right in with uh, people who say that they're feminists because that's not always a, a meaningful term to me. It's like saying atheists think this. You know, it's such a large umbrella. The broad, grand generalizations don't begin to encapsulate the diverse cultures that embrace the label. You'll find all kinds, all shades, all manner of atheists, as you'll find all kinds and shades and manners of feminists, some productive, some destructive, and everybody in between, correct? Yeah, yeah, and that's that's why I think the Satanic Temple is often very hesitant to align with any other groups. And in fact, we just won't do so unless we have a limited project with very clear goals in mind. You know, when we're working with Americans United or Freedom from Religion Foundation, we're working on very specific projects. But you're not really going to find us uh, merging with a movement or organization on some kind of permanent and more broad basis than that. Alexander, does that answer your question? Anything to add? Uh, yes, absolutely it does. Um, thank you both very much. I would just like to to clarify our type of feminism is essentially we are egalitarians, therefore we do feminist activism. We are secular humanists, therefore we do atheist activism and work with groups like FFRF and, um, as you say, in a focus scope with groups like the Satanic Temple, and we're happy for all the work that you guys do. Thanks so much for the call. Thank you. Look forward to working with you in the future. Take Appreciate care, you, guys. Alexander. Thank you so much. Okay, so my home state of Oklahoma, we love us some Jesus in this state, Lucian. I mean, he's Jesus everywhere. I called Tulsa Jesus Town. I've got Oral Roberts University 15 minutes over here. I've got Rama Bible Training Center 10 minutes to my north. I've got 300 some churches within the city limits. And we've got Jesus speak everywhere. 
Recently, there was controversy about a Ten Commandments monument on display on taxpayer-funded Capitol grounds in Oklahoma City, and the Satanic Temple gets involved. Tell us that story. Well, what Oklahoma did to get the Ten Commandments monument put on the Capitol grounds was disingenuous from the very start, and they opened the door for organizations like the Satanic Temple to also put a monument on the Capitol grounds. Uh, Obviously, they thought it would never happen, and they were putting forward arguments that they never thought anybody would call their bluff on. To wit, those arguments were that the Ten Commandments monument being privately donated didn't constitute then government speech, so it wasn't an Establishment Clause issue. It was private speech. They then opened the Capitol grounds necessarily as a limited public forum for private donated monuments. In case that argument didn't work, they also put forward the notion that the Ten Commandments monument didn't constitute religious speech at all, that it was a historical document, a monument to a historical document that spoke to the codification of U.S. law, that these were the foundational uh, laws that were incorporated into U.S. law, never mind the fact that many of the Ten Commandments are counter-constitutional putting prohibitions against free exercise and free speech. So in calling their bluff, the Satanic Temple then offered their own privately donated monument, uh, Baphomet, and I don't know if people have seen the the images. Um, It's a large, goat-headed, humanoid, demonic type of character with uh, angel wings and all these binary elements. And the binary elements, it's pointing above, it's pointing below. There's the inverted star behind it, uh, one point up star on its head, has three horns with the torch of knowledge in the middle, the human animal elements and the caduceus in the middle signifying uh, reconciliation and negotiation. And we thought those binary elements, that idea of the reconciliation of the opposites was a very powerful message when we were seeking to put the Baphomet monument alongside the Ten Commandments monument. And we thought that this would pay very obvious homage to religious freedom and uh, true American values of plurality, that one religious voice wasn't going to co-opt the power and the authority of the government, and that uh, we were going to reassert that religious liberty truly is for all. And we contrived an argument that we felt was in every way parallel, if not superior, to the arguments endorsing the Ten Commandments monument being put on the Capitol grounds. At some point, the state Supreme Court of Oklahoma had to consider whether or not the Ten Commandments monument being on the grounds was a violation of church and state. And this was while we were still fighting to have them consider our monument proposal at all. And as I said earlier, the state Supreme Court ruled against the Ten Commandments monument, but uh, it was generally felt that the state Supreme Court must have very much had the Baphomet proposal in mind, knowing that whatever decision they came to regarding the Ten Commandments monument would have very direct implications on our request to put up the Baphomet monument, and there was really no way around it. They took the the Ten Commandments down. Um, This is all playing out all over again in Arkansas right now, where not only did they make similar arguments for the Ten Commandments monument, they actually put forward the same bill. So you know that this is coming from some some other source than independent uh, senators and in legislatures acting on their own to put up the Ten Commandments monument. There's a coherent movement to not only plant ministers and other theocrats in, in government office, but they're also writing their own bills and legislation, too. And that problem is getting worse and worse. As someone who's part of this culture, the invocation of the Satanic Temple and the Baphomet monument caused a visceral reaction in cultural Christians all around me. They were genuinely scared. It, first of all, had not occurred to them that there might be another religion (laughs) in the world. I mean, to them, there's Christianity. And of course, if we're talking about God, we're talking about the Christian God. They exist in this microcosm where if you talk about freedom of religion, you're only talking about their particular religion. You probably run into that a ton here in the heartland. Right. And and, the knee-jerk reaction we get from these Christians is, you know, sometimes they'll scoff with a certain amount of disdain and say, well, 
this really isn't an issue because you are not really a religion and you admit it. You say you don't believe in Satan. You know, you don't believe in a personal Satan. You're non-theistic. It's not a religion. Uh, what they don't realize, I think, is, is what a perilous path it is for the courts to go defining religion very strictly. And they've been very reticent to do so. And most of the time when we speak to lawyers about this, uh, lawyers don't actually feel that our credibility as a religion is going to really be called into question in the courts. We know it has been when it comes to the flying spaghetti monster in certain cases, but uh, I feel we're a lot different in a lot of different ways. And we're not the only non-theistic religion in existence. You know, it's not, it's not that radical an idea, and it's not that new, and it's not that bizarre. And, and I think there's going to be a very difficult time for somebody to say that we're, we're not a religion and otherwise, it doesn't seem to matter one way or the other, the fear factor that surrounds this. We are very open about being non-theistic. It doesn't stop the superstitious from being terrified of the imagery and of the monument itself. And while in Oklahoma, there was a very visceral response from Christians, we saw that firsthand in Detroit when we actually unveiled the monument at an unveiling event. And uh, I don't know if you saw... Uh, Lisa Ling on CNN did a 45-minute episode on This Is Life about the unveiling of our monument, and I felt it kind of underplayed the chaos that surrounded that whole event, although it may have seemed to have increased magnitude just being on the inside of it. But um, there was death threats, there were protests, and, and just some of the commentary we saw from people, it seemed as though they genuinely believed that this monument, this icon, would bring evil upon them, would bring, would raise the crime rate, would cause death and destruction, and would, you know, maybe come to life and walk about and, and murder their families at night. That was, that was the level, level of desperate horror we saw from people when we were unveiling that. Don't forget my supporters on Patreon get a completely commercial-free version of the broadcast and an extra show, a bonus broadcast every month. You can support me there at patreon.com slash Seth Andrews, and it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. My special guest today, Lucian Greaves, is co-founder of the Satanic Temple. He's an atheist who is also a Satanist. We were talking just a few minutes ago about evil, about the fear of evil here in American culture, and I want to bring up and talk about the witch hunt of the 20th century, and you brought it up earlier, the satanic panic. I think you and I both lived through that, right? Uh, this is yeah. the time period of the 80s and early 90s where we were looking for hidden messages and everything from comic books. We're playing records backwards, trying to expose the devil's voice. Children's toys were being condemned for being instruments of dark power. Uh, we pretty much wrote off anybody and everybody who played Dungeons and Dragons. What was your experience with the Satanic Panic? And do you think that the Satanic Panic is over, or does it continue today? Thank you for asking that. No, I do not think it's over. And in fact, I know it's not over. And this was an area of research of mine ever since I got out of high school, well long before uh, long before the Satanic Temple was was any type of idea at all whatsoever. It was really because of the satanic panic, I think, that I grew very interested in knowing who self-identifies as, as a Satanist and what Satanism means to the people who do. And in this at a time, of course, where I had increased skepticism on all things that I was raised to believe were true, and then really growing an affinity towards the satanic. It's not far off to say that the satanic panic really made me who I am today, and by extension makes the satanic temple what it is. And the panic... It was marked from beginning in 1980 and, and to have ended around 1995 when it lost favor in the mainstream media. You wouldn't see those kind of Geraldo shows anymore after 1995. But the practices that brought on the Satanic Panic are, are still very much in play. They're just not publicized anymore. The recovered memory therapy, this idea of multiple personality disorder, now called dissociative identity disorder, and this is where... This is where I'm sure you'll get some comments on your on your Facebook or, or wherever else you post this, where people say, "Oh, well, no, dissociative identity disorder is completely real, and this is, and, and he doesn't know what he's talking about, or whatever." 
It's not. It's not. It's an iatrogenic condition. This is something that's clinically created. It doesn't mean that the suffering isn't real of the people who are diagnosed with it and are made to express their malaise in this fashion and are subsequently convinced then that they have multiple personalities or even worse, that they have dredged up memories of traumas that never existed before the the therapy inculcated them with these false memories. And you still see to this day professional organizations like the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, which is the preeminent professional group that studies dissociative disorders like dissociative identity disorder. They have just in the background, you can find it on their website, ritual abuse, mind control, special interest groups. And there are conferences coming up next month, and they have different little workshops that have to do with ritual abuse and government mind control. And you have within the licensed mental health community, people who hold to the most tinfoil hat of conspiracy theories related to government mind control. And that, I mean, it's just, it's so over the top. This theory that dissociative identity disorder is caused by extreme trauma that causes the personalities to split into different compartmentalized parts of the mind that can hold only so much trauma, so it causes this type of splitting. That, that's a well-known theory to a lot of people. I think what they don't know is the prevalence of people in organizations like the ISSTD who actually believe that that trauma is being weighed upon people intentionally to mind control them and turn them into multiple personality disorder robots of types where they have separate personalities devised to enact different functions. I mean, this this is all going to sound absolutely lunatic, and I might sound lunatic just for conveying that I believe that people believe this, but they absolutely do. And if you're interested in the research we've done, because the Satanic Temple is very active in trying to bring additional oversight to the licensing boards in the mental health field, check out grayfaction.org. The gray faction of the Satanic Temple is very much dedicated into trying to head off any new Satanic panic in hoping to bring rationalism to the fields of therapy, to mental health care. I had an email from Camille who said that she's about to graduate from college and she and her husband are moving to Texas where she's going to begin teaching high school English. She says, I'm teaching with the intent of moving through the education system, principalship, superintendency, school board. I'm hoping Lucian will have some advice for an atheist school teacher trying not to step on the toes of fellow teachers and educational peers that are quite passionately religious, especially with the intent that I would like to be considered a positive impact on my students' lives to be considered for higher roles within education. And often the non-churchgoer is subconsciously seen as a negative impact. Lucian, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I sympathize, and and I didn't envision this for me at all. When we were first working on this, we thought it would be a more limited kind of project, and we could get the word out, and people would then, we hoped, take on the banner of the Satanic Temple, and it would operate more like Anonymous, where anybody could be the Satanic Temple, and then I wouldn't have to have ruined my career prospects and my general reputation by attaching myself to Satanism, it's worked out a lot better than I ever thought it could have. But I didn't jump into this laughing. I didn't think this was a was a great joke. But, uh, you know, you see things like the pink mass and you think this looks like a good time and these guys, you know, must really have been having fun doing it. But I, I did it in a very fatalistic way. And I felt it felt very much like suicide to me having my my face out there. But it was also so very much worth doing. You know, when I saw people's lives ruined by the satanic panic, that idea of attaching yourself to Satanism, it it seems as though it's one of those things that can haunt you and and have you attached to uh, criminal accusations that people will believe even if there's no, no evidence to them at all. I've seen that happen before. I've seen people so wrongly accused of things and so obviously wrongly accused of things, and yet their lives entirely ruined. So even now when people are coming into the Satanic Temple and they're very quick to put their name and face out there, I tell them to be circumspect and to realize what risks are involved. I don't tell them to not do it because the more people do this kind of thing, 
the better off we all are, the more people who come forward and, and identify with us and the more people who will say that they do take offense when a politician says that they don't feel a non-believer can be a good and moral person, that they can be a good citizen in the United States, the less people take it for granted that our politicians need to identify with a religion and ask, well, where's the non-religious voice in here? The more we assert ourselves, the better off we are. But it's going to be difficult in these early phases here when it's it's fallen so far out of fashion and in thinking beyond the norm on religious thought is is so very much frowned upon still. You know, all I can ask people to do is is take a rational consideration of their own circumstances and decide what's best for them and, and best for the people around them. You know, I don't have kids. I have very little to worry about in the way of family being stained by my name or, or running into problems of lunatics hunting them down or whatever else. But some people don't have that liberty. And I, I completely understand when they need to take a step back or when they silently endorse us. You know, we, we have people who anonymously donate to our fund all the time and and they don't want to harm their career. They don't want to harm their position in the community, but they're still in one way or another letting their voice be known. And you have to be true to yourself, but you also have to be cognizant of the real world ramifications of what you do. I can't make that decision for anybody and nobody else can. You have to come to that on your own, but uh, it's very much something worth considering. Do you have people in the Satanic Temple who are members and never tell anyone? Yeah, I've gotten messages to that effect, but uh, usually they seem to take kind of a perverse pleasure in in, <laughs> in holding that little secret. Uh, at least by their tone, I'm not getting a whole lot of genuine fear from them, but they still, you know, somewhat begrudgingly keep their silence. Lucian, what do you say to people who declare you a cult leader? You know, this is a cult of personality, you're out in the media, you're a name and a face, you're enjoying the attention, it's all about Lucian. How do you respond to that? That, uh, you know, when people do throw the word cult around, and uh, you, you would have to really get them to define what a cult is, because I think we defy every legitimate definition of what a cult is supposed to be. But if the argument is uh, is really focused on having a supposedly charismatic character like myself, which I'd say thank you, I guess. I think people would be amazed at how uh, at how much I actually don't enjoy <laughs> enjoy the attention. I've gotten a lot better at it now. I re- I've always enjoyed bringing attention to the issues, but I, I very much don't like I, I don't like being on camera. I, I really didn't like for a long time even doing interviews at all. Mm. People claim I've done them well. And I feel I've gotten a lot better as time has gone on. But it was something, like I said, I I felt the beginning was was very was very rough. And and I very much felt that I had committed a type of suicide by choosing this path and doing these types of activities and that it would be uh, all but impossible for me to live a normal life hereafter. Things have gotten a lot better, a lot better since. But, well, um, I'm interested in this, Lucian. I mean, I, I'm an activist. I was an activist as a believer. I was always out there on the front lines. I was sort of at the forefront of the conversation. Back then, I wanted to change the world. Today, I want to change the world. I guess it's how I'm wired. Are you an activist in your bones? Do you just feel compelled to get out there and stir the pot and be on the front lines? Because I think Many people really are. There are some people who are passive about issues, and there are people who are very active. You just seem active. Would you embrace that for yourself? Yeah, and for me, it's it's entirely about the issues. Uh, the self-promotion aspect doesn't mean anything to me, and I think it's very transparent when people are in it for the, the self-promotion and when people are just in it to put their face in the news. And honestly, if that's what we're doing, there's a lot more we could do to exploit that and do things differently. I think we've been very calculated and and, uh, very cautious and have made sure that when we put forward a campaign and fought for different issues that we actually had something to say about those issues and that there were actions we were going to take if our position wasn't respected. We we never like to bluff. You know, if if we're saying we want to give an invocation or we want to be in a school district where there's a good news club or any of these things we want to do, 
we do that when we feel very confident that we can follow up on it, that we can sue, that we can take it to the absolute limit. And we've actually had a lot of offers for documentaries, television shows, and other things that we just didn't feel advanced the dialogue at all. And we've turned them down and we, we will continue to do so. And, and in fact, I think there's probably a good number of studios in New York that scratch their heads wondering, you know, where, where they went wrong because we've gotten a lot of proposals and have just said no. And I think we've gotten a lot of people thinking that we're very media hungry when in fact we're not. Lucian Greaves is coming after your children, folks. This is probably one of the worst fears of Christian parents. When Satan comes after the children, because this is how Satan was framed for us growing up. He lurks in the shadows. He wants our children. And now the Satanic Temple has children's books. Tell me about these Satanic children's books, how they came about, what they do, how they're being used. Certainly. Well, the... the the first time we made any uh, Satanic children's books, we made the Satanic Temples, I think we called it the Big Satanic Book of Activities. Uh, <laughs> and actually, we had put that together as a, just kind of a promotional item to put as a PDF on our website for the Protect Children Project, which is where we offer a religious exemption for children in schools that still practice corporal punishment, being that one of our tenants is the body is inviolable subject to one's own will alone. We feel that uh, school administration punitively beating children is, is kind of a violation of, of our religious liberty. So we had these materials on the Protect Children Project website, and then we were contacted sometime later by the Freedom From Religion Foundation about a jurisdiction in Florida where they were allowing for the passive distribution of religious materials in a public school. And there again was the idea that there was an open forum so anybody could join. So this wasn't actually uh, giving religious privilege to any specific religious organization, even though it was pretty much just the evangelicals who were there giving out Bibles and other Jesus-centered materials. Of course, then we offered to put the Satanic Big Book of Activities in the schools, and they shut down the forum entirely. Um, we also made this offer in Colorado, and I think they kept the forum open and that our materials were distributed in the school, but I'm not entirely sure. Coloring books, puzzles, what's in them? Oh, yeah, word searches, puzzles, uh, pro-social messages. But just as with our after-school Satan Club program, which we've put together to counterbalance the encroachment of evangelical after-school clubs in the, in the schools, we don't put items of religious opinion in any of them. We still don't feel that that's the place of, of anybody in the schools and that, you know, children should come to their kind of uh, religious understandings on their, on their own as they grow up and as people get older. But we do think that just the presence of something endorsed by Satanists, something put there in the schools by the Satanic Temple, sends a clear enough message to both the children and the, and the theocrats trying to get evangelical materials in. To the uh, theocrats, it shows the, the typical message that we usually put forward, that if you're going to accept one religious voice, you need to accept them all. But I actually think it's a positive message to the children, because the children are being told this narrative about accepting Jesus, especially when it comes to the good news clubs and other evangelical groups, and that they need to accept the, the Christian doctrine in order to be good people, and probably that if anybody identifies with something that's openly contrary to that, that they're evil, non-productive members of society and criminal. And when they see that there is productive, friendly people who identify as Satanists doing anything positive at all, it, it very much undermines that narrative. And I think that kind of gets back to what you earlier said about people who object to the name Satanism and, and Satanism being attached to different activities that then make those activities look bad. I think we're doing a very good thing when we do this, when we cause people to reconsider what they think they know about Satanism. It's never been helpful to preserve this notion of the Satanic cult conspiracy. Uh, we talked about the satanic panic. 
And we have no reservations on doing violence to those delusions that people hold, those conspiracy theories that people have. And at the end of this all, if we can get people to consider the, the very basic fact that different symbols mean different things to different people, different religious identifications mean different things to different people, and that there isn't some kind of core intrinsic value to symbols and cultures, and that they are malleable to what we make of them. I think we've hopefully brought a very positive lesson to the world at large. What do most people get wrong about the Satanic Temple? I mean, you're dealing all the time with assumption or misinformation. What do they get wrong, and what is the Satanic Temple? Put a punctuation mark on this whole thing, and then how people can find out more about you, okay? I would say that the Satanic Temple is the future of religion. It's not a non-religion. It's not a prank. It's not merely a political movement, even though it can be it can be more than one thing. I think uh, I think, as I said previously, it's the future of religion. You're going to find a lot more people identifying atheistically with their religious cultures and hopefully using, as we do, science as the arbiter of truth claims. And then people will not have to shy away from the art, metaphor, and literature that they love just to appease the more superstitious in our ranks. Uh, People don't need to uh, subscribe to intellectually insulting assumptions in order to identify with their religious values. And I think the more time goes on, the more people will understand that that's what we're about. And when I finally have the opportunity and I might not within these, uh, at least within these four years of the Trump administration, to sit and elaborate these things better in book form, I think then there will be a a good deal of understanding also. But um, for now, you know, we we knew what we were getting into when we jumped into this, and, you know, I can't be entirely surprised that there's a lot of people who don't understand where we're coming from. But I hold out the hope that the more we do what we're doing— the more people are corrected of whatever they've gotten wrong and that the more people will be willing to understand where we're coming from and not willfully misinterpret what we're doing. For those who want to go deeper, what's the website? www.thesatanictemple.com and feel free to follow us on Twitter, uh, Satanic Psalms. And I'm on Twitter also at Lucian Greaves. Lucian Greaves, you've been a great guest. It's been a compelling conversation. Thanks so much for spending this time with us. I myself am going to shopsatan.com just because I got to see what you have on the homepage. (laughs) I got to go check this out, man. You've been a lot of fun to talk to, and it's been interesting watching uh, sort of the headlines that involve what the Satanic Temple has been about out there. So thanks for sharing that with us, and we'll see you out there on the road, my friend. Great. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. And that's the show today. I'll be back here Tuesday of next week as we talk to David Fitzgerald, historical researcher and author of the new book, Jesus Mything in Action. He thinks there was never even a man named Jesus that the legend was based upon. And we're going to hear why next week. And I'll see you then. Take care. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com